At 1.23 in the morning, an explosion rips through the quiet night in Ukraine, 50 miles north of the capital, Kiev. Chernobyl Reactor 4 has detonated, releasing 400 times the radiation as the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima. But how did this happen? Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has suffered one of the worst disasters in the history of nuclear power. The shift leader of reactor unit four checks the time. Five more minutes before the test begins. He sits with his team of operators in the control room located below ground. They are preparing to test the safety of Chernobyl Reactor 4 in the event of a power failure. So far, everything seems fine. Nuclear reactors work by using radioactive fuel to generate heat. This heat then converts water into steam, which is used to spin a turbine, outputting electricity. Chernobyl Reactor 4 was a Soviet RBMK reactor. Unlike Western reactors, which slow down the reaction as temperature rises, Increasing the temperature in an RBMK reactor causes the nuclear reaction to speed up. This in turn increases the temperature, which then further increases the reaction speed, creating a feedback loop that can quickly get out of control. This is inherently an unsafe design, and will factor into the tragedy that is soon to follow. In order to prevent the core from overheating, two methods are used. First, control rods are raised or lowered to control the power output of the core. When lowered, they absorb neutrons, which slow down the rate of reaction. The second method is water, which is pumped throughout the core to act as a coolant. In the event of a power failure, the reactors of Chernobyl are equipped with three backup diesel generators to keep the water pumps running. But it takes one and a half minutes before the generators reach full power. During this one and a half minute gap, the core is at risk of overheating. Chernobyl scientists had theorized that the residual momentum of the steam turbines may be just enough to power the water pumps during the one and a half minute gap, giving enough time for the emergency generators to kick in. Figuring out whether this is possible is the subject of the upcoming experiment. At one o'clock in the morning, the shift leader gives the go ahead for his team to begin powering down the reactor. Up until now, the reactor has been running at full power following normal operation. Steadily, the operators begin to reduce the power of Reactor 4. At around 2 o'clock p.m., the emergency core cooling system is switched off. By this time, the nuclear reactor is running at about 50% power. Under the normal procedures for the test, the reactor would have then been reduced to around 30%. However, around this time, Soviet authorities pause the shutdown procedure because there is a demand for additional power on the power grid. Instead of shutting down, the reactor is held at 50% for another 9 hours. During this time, the reactor begins to undergo an effect known as xenon poisoning. When uranium-235 splits during fission, one of the resulting products is an unstable iodine-135, which further decays into xenon-135. Xenon-135 is great at absorbing neutrons, and thus has the effect of slowing down a nuclear reaction. Under normal operational conditions, there are enough neutrons in the reaction to help counteract a buildup of xenon-135. But with a 50% decrease in power, this is no longer true. On its own, xenon poisoning would not cause a catastrophe, as it merely slows down the nuclear reaction. However, it will play a role in the events that are yet to come. At 11.10pm, the operators are given permission to continue shutting down the reactor. At this point, Reactor 4 is now in the hands of the less experienced night crew, which, according to some accounts, never received proper instructions to carry out this test. 33-year-old Alexander Akimov takes over as the Unit 4 shift chief leader in charge. The previous shift chief, Yuri Tregub, is free to leave, but he decides to stay to help with the experiment. The power level of the core is now at around 20%. So far, everything seems to be going smoothly. The reactor is placed on auto control to keep the power level steady. All of a sudden, the power plummets to 1%. Something is wrong. This is the result of the xenon poisoning mentioned earlier, which is absorbing the neutrons and slowing down the reaction. Akimov relays the issue to Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov. What happened next is still a subject of debate today. According to some accounts, Akimov and his colleague Toptonov tried to convince Dyatlov to abort the test, but are overridden. According to others, there never was any conflict, and the team was simply performing as usual. Whatever the case, we do know that they attempted to restart the reactor. 
Against all safety precautions, the engineers withdraw nearly all of the control rods in an effort to bring the reactor back to power. Additionally, emergency safety measures are disabled to prevent them from interfering with the experiment. The power of the reactor begins to rise. The power of the core is up to 7%, but it will not go any higher. Xenon poisoning has seen to that. The flow of water is now being controlled manually, which is extremely difficult as a small temperature change can cause a large power fluctuation. The reactor is getting more unstable. At 1.23 in the morning, the experiment finally begins. It lasts a total of 40 seconds. During this time, water in the nuclear reactor boils. Boiling water is less effective at absorbing neutrons, and the power in the nuclear reactor begins to increase. Akamov pushes the emergency shutoff button AZ-5, which lowers all the control rods back into the reactor. In theory, this sounds like a great idea, as it should seriously slow down the chain reaction. Except it has a design flaw. As the rods are inserted, they displace the neutron absorbing water below them. Additionally, the tips of the rods are made of graphite, which actually increases the nuclear reaction speed. To make matters worse, the neutron absorbing xenon gas, which had been suppressing the nuclear reaction, has been rapidly burning off as power in the reactor increases. At this point, there is almost nothing holding back the nuclear reaction. As the pressure increases, the fuel rods rupture, causing the control rods to get stuck with their graphite tips still inside the reactor. Within 4 seconds, the power in the reactor surges to an estimated 20 times the maximum output. The exact amount will never be known, as recording instruments have been destroyed by this point. At 1.23 and 44 seconds in the morning, the reactor explodes. The intense pressure caused by the steam ruptures the reactor, flinging the 1,000 ton lid through the roof. The release of radiation begins. The surrounding air glows blue as neutrons ionize the air. This is known as Chernikov radiation. At the time of the explosion, 35-year-old engineer Valery Kodmachuk is manning the circulating pump engine room. He's killed immediately by the blast, becoming the first casualty of this Chernobyl incident. Shortly after the explosion, Valery Pervzchenko arrives at the control room. He reports his findings to Dyatlov, but Dyatlov doesn't believe that the core is destroyed. Akimov also has trouble believing that the reactor is destroyed. After all, they have been told that RBMK reactors cannot explode. Pervizchenko leaves the control room and checks the radiation levels with a dosimeter, before going to search for Kodumchuk. During his search, he navigates through radioactive rubble which emits over 10,000 Röntgens per hour. It is here that he receives a lethal dose of radiation. Meanwhile, Dyatlov sends two junior technicians, Alexander Kudryatsev and Viktor Poskaryakov, to the reactor to manually lower the presumably seized control rods. In reality, the reactor and the control rods have been destroyed. As the two make their way towards the reactor, they run into Alexander Yuchenko. At the time of the blast, Alexander Yuchenko was in his office between reactors 3 and 4. After the explosion, he checked on the damage and was horrified to see a major chunk of the building missing. Afterwards, he encounters Perevizchenko, who is vomiting and losing consciousness, but details of their interaction are not well documented. Eventually, he runs into the two junior technicians on their way to the reactor. Despite Yevchenko's explanation that there are no control rods left, the men decide to continue anyways. Yevchenko, knowing the full extent of the danger, makes the decision to accompany them. The entrance to the reactor room is blocked by a heavy steel door. Yevchenko forces it open and holds it ajar while Kutryatsev and Proskaryakov enter to check on the control rods. Confronted with the open flames of the exposed reactor, the skin on their faces quickly darkens, resembling a sunburn. Kutryatsev and Proskaryakov are only inside the reactor room for a minute, but within that time, both receive a fatal dose of radiation. Along with Perevizchenko, these three men will be the first to succumb to the effects of Chernobyl radiation at the Moscow hospital soon after. Yevchenko will survive, but not without serious health complications, including radiation burns on the left side of his body from holding open the door. Firefighters arrive on scene. Some of them pick up radioactive graphite in their hands, curious and unaware of the danger. By 5 o'clock in the morning, Dyatlov begins to fall ill from radiation sickness after receiving a dose of 390 rem, which kills about 50% of people. He is taken to a hospital and survives. 
Later, he will be sentenced to 10 years in prison for his actions. At this point, Akimov still thinks the reactor core is intact. Believing that coolant water may be obstructed in a closed valve somewhere in the plant, he and Toptonov, along with a couple other men, make their way into the water room. They spend hours turning valves in an effort to cool a non-existing reactor while wading through a knee-deep mixture of radioactive fuel and water. As time passes, they begin to feel weak and have trouble turning the valves. By 6 o'clock in the morning, Akimov is falling ill from radiation exposure. During their time in the water room, both Akimov and Toptonov receive a lethal dose of radiation. The accounts I covered are just a small portion of what occurred at Chernobyl, and it took me many hours to put this video together. If you'd like to support this channel, just simply leave a like and comment below if you have a suggestion for a future video. Thanks for watching.